Hey Internet, I'm Trace Dominguez, and this is Test Tube Plus. It's a podcast where we take big topics and big ideas and we break them up and try and make them a little more manageable. This week we're going to talk about artificial intelligence, so open up your brains and let's let the robots in, huh? What is artificial intelligence? I mean, I guess really when you ask that, you have to know what is intelligence. So, Intelligence is the ability to acquire and apply knowledge or skills, according to the dictionary. But people like Einstein said that the true sign of intelligence isn't knowing or knowledge, but imagination. Let's try and translate that to a machine, though. It's not exactly easy. In 1983, education professor Howard Gardner came up with the theory of multiple intelligence, which just makes things even more complicated. There's the linguistic intelligence, which is like being word smart. There's being number or reasoning smart, picture smart, body smart, music smart, self smart, people smart, nature smart. You get the idea. There's a lot of different intelligences. It doesn't necessarily matter how we talk about intelligence. Intelligence is sort of like pornography. You know it when you see it, right? We know what things are intelligent, what things aren't intelligent. You have to tell us that they are. People know elephants are intelligent, even if we don't know how that intelligent works. So using that kind of an idea of we kind of all have an idea of what intelligence is, John McCarthy coined the term artificial intelligence in 1956. And for some reason, chess is like the measure that people use for artificial intelligence. I don't know why it's chess. It's a complicated game. I was always more of a checkers man myself. But uh, the Mechanical Turk was a robot chess player, could beat real people, and it was built in the late 1700s. Uh, it may have played Ben Franklin, might have played with Napoleon. Uh, it was a case, like a wooden case, with a man robot that sat at that case and a chessboard on top of it. And the man robot was dressed like a man from Turkey, so it was called the Mechanical Turk. In the 1820s, after playing lots and lots of people, it was uncovered as a hoax. And what happened is inside of this case, when they would show off the Mechanical Turk, they would open it up. And they would show all of the mechanics inside of there, the things that were running this amazing robot. And then they would close it up, and they would have somebody sit down and play it in chess. It turned out there was a chess master who would sneak up into that case after he closed it, like a little magic trick. And the chess master was operating the Mechanical Turk, playing chess. It was still a human person who was playing chess. They were just doing it through a machine. So that's how they knew it was a hoax. Somebody figured out that there was a chess player under there. This, though, inspired the creation of the first difference engine, which is sort of like the single cell organism of the computer world. The difference engine was something that would decide a math problem, like adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing. And eventually, that tiny computer that came about in the early 1900s Eventually, Garry Kasparov played chess against Deep Blue. That was in 1996, and he won. And then in 97, the machine beat him. I mean, that's a really short amount of time. If you think of all of human history, we went from we could build a machine that couldn't play chess to a machine that could play chess on its own in only 70 years, 100 years, really. Like, if you go from the 1700s actually into the 1900s, you're talking a lot more time. But once computers came about, it didn't take that long for us to build one that could be just as good as us at something very specific. The tournament that Garry Kasparov lost to IBM's Deep Blue is kind of incredible. They would play a series of chess games against each other. And the first time in 96, Kasparov was like, cool, I'm good, I'm going to beat this machine. But the second time in 97, the tournament in move 44 of the first game, Deep Blue moved its rook, which in the grand scheme of chess game probably isn't that big a deal. But because it's Garry Kasparov, like one of the best chess players at the time ever, he thought that this hyper-intelligent machine was making a specific move and he didn't understand what it was. So he was freaking out. And he thought this hyper-intelligent deep blue machine is going to do something crazy. And it's knowing more about chess than I am. But in reality, it was a bug in the computer. And it just did this weird counterintuitive move. The machine could calculate 200 million moves per second. But because this was a bug, Kasparov was thrown off 
thinking that the superior machine was actually doing some kind of counterintuitive ruse, and that anxiety may help them lose the tournament, which is crazy. So even when a machine screws up, humans, humans lose. Puny humans. But from there, AI throughout history hasn't just been about playing games. It's also been about accomplishing discrete tasks. For example, uh, maybe you saw the movie The Imitation Game. Uh, Alan Turing was trying to crack the Enigma machine, which was a British coding machine. If you want to know the whole story, watch the movie. It's great. But uh, it was designed to take in information and then try all of these different possibilities to get the answer, which would break the code and then allow them to decode what the Enigma machine was encoding. The movie gets its name from Turing's test, which he wrote a mathematical paper on, called The Imitation Game. And it works like this. Uh, the Turing test was a way for, that Turing came up with to determine whether or not a computer was thinking on its own. So an interrogator sits at a computer terminal and types to a hidden entity on the other end of that terminal, maybe in another room or wherever. And after five minutes, if the entity can convince interrogators 30% of the time that the entity is a human, they will pass the Turing test. The thing is, the interrogator doesn't know if they're talking to a computer or a human. So sometimes they actually are talking to a human, and they can ask them questions like, you know, say, my name is, and then just type random characters. And if the computer types back, hello, random characters, then you're probably sure it's a computer. But it could just be a human messing with you. So you have to ask it more questions than that and get kind of an idea of conversation. The implication being, of course, that the computer is listening to you, responding, and thinking through its answers. So then computers can think as a human. This was during World War II. If you've been on the internet in the last 20 years, as someone who's my age, <laughs> you've talked to a chat bot before. And essentially, the Turing test can be passed by most chat bots today. Uh, they, the first chat bot, or a computer that tries to do intelligent conversation, was in 1964. It was called Eliza. And there was also another one named Perry in the 70s. And then Alice in the 90s. These are all uh, acronyms, by the way. Alice is the Artificial Linguistics Internet Computer Entity. Then there was Jabberwacky, Cleverbot, Lbot, UltraHal. Uh, Cleverbot's still around. You can talk to him. I was talking to him yesterday. Um, Eugene Gustman in the 2000s was the most clever one and may have been the first chatbot computer to pass the Turing test. It was huge news. So what happened is Eugene Gustman, which is a weird name, but uh, was supposed to be a 13-year-old Ukrainian boy. And the interrogators were convinced that this chatbot was a human who is a 13-year-old Ukrainian boy, 33% of the time. So does that not mean that the Turing test was passed? The reason that it, some people would argue no is because it wasn't a fully capable machine. It was playing this weird game of not being a fully-fledged person, but rather tricking the interrogator into giving it more slack, which, I don't know, if the computer had figured that out on its own, I would say the Turing test was definitely passed because they programmed it to be like, oh, I don't know, I don't, I'm not very good with English. That's not necessarily, it's not very, not very clean pass, you know, even though it did convince 33% of the interrogators that it was a human. But in the end, is convincing someone over a chat system that you can have a conversation, is that really a good way to tell if something is thinking? I mean, the Turing test is just one way to do that. And even if it is just a chat bot, it is pretty smart to be able to have a real conversation. There have been times where I remember being younger and on you know, AOL Instant Messenger, and an IM popped up, and I thought it was a person for a while before I realized it was really just an ad trying to get me to go to some stupid website. In the end, intelligence is really, really difficult to measure. Like I said earlier, we know it when we see it. We can tell that other humans are intelligent. You can tell 
that animals like dolphins and chimps, um, dogs, cats, whales, we can see the intelligence in them. But really, you can't measure it very well. Is a baby human intelligent? It doesn't really seem to do that much when it's a newborn. Does that mean it's not intelligent yet? Of course it is. It's got the potential for intelligence, we can tell. But you can't really test for it. But it's not really about testing your brain when it comes to AI anyway, right? It's about what can that AI do? So that was a broad stroke at the history of artificial intelligence. This week we're going to be looking at the capabilities, the threats, the future of AI, and be sure to subscribe to this channel, come back, and thank you for watching.